Welcome back to Inhibition. Today's topic, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What started it all? Is Israel a war criminal? It's time we talk about it. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Before we jump into the topic today, if you're new here, we drop videos every single week related to politics and religion and things in the news. So if you're interested, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a video. Let's jump into it. Now, why are we talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict now? Well, it's been in the news. So just recently, starting at the end of April, moving in through the month of May, there have been battles and airstrikes from Israel to Gaza and Gaza to Israel. Many people People have died, including civilians. This has been all through the news. And so we want to talk about what started this conflict. And we're going to talk about what started it in 2021. But we want to go back and do some history. So we're going to talk a lot about the history of this conflict, where it came from and how it started. Now, some people only go back as far as the early 1900s, even some in the late 1800s. Some people think that's where the conflict started. And it did re-escalate then, but it didn't start there. And I'll tell you why. It actually goes back thousands of years. And even though the Palestinians didn't exist thousands of years ago, the reason it goes back that far is because Israel existed. And Israel existed in that land. And that's why it becomes important. So how did this actually begin? Well, historically, Israel was a nation in the land of the Middle East and was founded by the Hebrew people. And they believed God had promised them that land. Now, I won't go into the scriptures in the Bible that talk about this. If you're a Christian or a Jew, you would understand that it goes all the way back to the time of Abraham. God promised the land to Israel. Abraham and his descendants, ultimately reiterating that promise through Isaac and Jacob and then ultimately the Israeli people. Now, you don't have to believe that. I personally am a Christian who does believe that God promised this land, but historically and all the information we're going to talk about today, even if you didn't believe that God promised them that land, it doesn't change the history of what's happening. So we're going to talk about the history and break this down. They believe that God promised this land and through the generations, what would happen is Israel would be in the land and and then as a sovereign nation, everything would be good. And then all of a sudden, due to whatever reason, a foreign power would come in and they would be under the rule of a foreign power. This happened back and forth throughout Israel's history. And finally, in 63 BCE, Rome conquered the land of Israel, the empire of Rome. And for about 130 years, Rome actually ruled the land, but they allowed Israel to function as a vassal state. If you don't know what a vassal state is, it's just a state with varying degrees of independence in its internal affairs, but it was dominant dominated by another state in its foreign affairs and potentially wholly subject to that dominating state. This is kind of how Rome worked. We'll let you govern your internal processes however you want. However, you're going to pay taxes to us and you're going to ultimately do what we say. And so that's kind of how Rome operated for about 130 years with Israel. This image right here on your screen is an image of the Roman Empire. And over here, that's the land of Israel. That's the land that we're dealing with in today's conflict. So the Roman Empire was huge and we're dealing with just one small part part of that empire. So what happened after that? Well, it all started with a revolt. The Judean population, which is the Hebrew people, the people of Israel, revolted against the Roman Empire in 66 CE, which culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE. Rome decimated Jerusalem and destroyed the people. The Romans actually in this destroyed the second temple and most of Jerusalem. So they destroyed most of Jerusalem and Israel and the Israeli temple that they had, the Jewish temple, they destroyed it. It was completely decimated. They killed many Jews, including armed rebels and innocent civilians who were in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Josephus says about 1.2 million Jews were killed. There's some historical debate on that, but it was a large number of Jews who were killed. And 97,000 Jews were enslaved. Many were forced to fight as gladiators in Roman Colosseums, and they eventually died. And then the rest of the Jews were dispersed out of the land. And this is what's known as diaspora or diaspora. This word simply means the 
the dispersing. So they were dispersed across the nations and they ceased to be an independent nation from that point on. So what came after that? After they were dispersed, what did Rome do? What happened? Well, Rome continued to control the land for the next seven centuries, almost 700 years, just under 700 years. They controlled the land. They renamed the land Palestina to mock the Jews. Now you may not understand why Palestina was mocking them, but the greatest enemy in Israel's history that they kind of repeatedly dealt with was the Philistines. Palestina was actually a Roman word for the Philistines. So they renamed the land Palestina, where we get Palestine, to mock the Jews. So the very name Palestine was intended to be an insult to the Jewish people. During the 7th century, Muhammad began military conquests in the name of Islam. So over time, this man named Muhammad, who is the prophet of Islam, started this new religion called Islam, and he initially started out peacefully, but over time, he became more and more militant, and he began to go in the name of Islam and conquer lands. The conquest included conflict with the Byzantine Empire. Now, the Byzantine Empire is just the Eastern Roman Empire, and it included the land of Palestina, or the land of Israel. And so he fought a conquest to try to overturn the Byzantine Empire. He didn't survive to see that happen, but after he died, the Islamic Caliphate, the Caliphate's just Islamic rule, they rose up and conquered the land of the Levant. Now, the Levant, that's just the historical region of the Syrian Empire, and that historical region of the Syrian Empire included the Byzantine Empire or Israel. So this is what the Levant looks like. You can see up here from the top all the way to the bottom, it includes the land of Israel, the Sinai Peninsula, some of Jordan. It includes a lot of the area that surrounds Israel today, as well as Israel itself. Now, the Levant might be a new phrase to you, but you may have actually heard it before without realizing it. If you remember when the terrorist organization ISIS, the Islamic State, they tried to set up a new Islamic caliphate, ISIS stood for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. That was ISIS. You will hear some people refer to them as ISIL, which is the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. And Syria today is a smaller country that ISIS did have control over. However, the Levant is a much larger land region and it's the old ancient Syria, the ancient kingdom of Syria. And so the problem is with calling them ISIL is they didn't actually control that land, but that's the land they wanted to control. When ISIS rose to power, they wanted to control the entire ancient Syrian empire, not just the current nation of Syria. So it was the Islamic state of Iraq and the Levant. Now, many people in the Middle East use this term ISIL, but we normally referred to them as ISIS more commonly. However, we did have a prominent president, President Obama at the time, that continually used the word ISIL, and he did so to link them to the whole land of the Levant. There was a big controversy about that and him using that term rather than ISIS. So what happened after they began to conquer the land of the Levant and all these other lands? Well, a bunch of other Islamic caliphates through the years began to rise to power, and some of them overlapped because they controlled different regions, but ultimately, as you can see, a whole bunch of other Islamic caliphates rose to power. Finally, a large Islamic caliphate rose to power called the Ottoman Empire. This rose to power in the 1500s, and this was an Islamic ca caliphate, and they did control the land of Israel. As a matter of fact, they controlled a lot more than the land of Israel. This is a map of the Ottoman Empire, and as you can see, they gained a whole lot of power. Now, early in the 1300s, uh, they had a small little region, but they didn't really gain major prominence until 1400s, moving into the 1500s, is when they gained major prominence. And you can see in the 1500s is when they took control of the land of Israel. And you can see here a whole lot of territory that they controlled, including land in Egypt. The Ottoman Empire was massive. They started in the area of Israel around the 1500s. And according to Ottoman records, as they've lasted there much past the 1500s, in 1878, 87% of the Ottoman Empire was in Palestine was Muslim, 10% Christian, 3% Jewish. In 1900, there were 600,000 people living in Palestine, and 94% of them were Arab. That is a large large majority of the people living in Palestine in 1900 under the Ottoman Empire. So where were the Jews during all this? Because again, remember, they got dispersed and then we haven't heard from them. Well, the Jews were dispersed and they assimilated into the nations across the world. By the time this all happened in the 1900s, they were dispersed all over the world. And while they were still Jewish, they didn't have a state, a Jewish state. Remember, they were dispersed back in 70 AD. So it's been a really long time since they were a nation. There was one such Jew named Theodore Herzl, his Hebrew name 
Benjamin Zeev, and he was a journalist, and he covered the Dreyfus Affair in France, which was an anti-Semitic political scandal, and it ended up dividing the French Republic. And it caused mass rallies to be held in France, where they began to shout, death to the Jews, death to the Jews. This was in the late 1800s, death to the Jews. And in that process, Herzl began to notice that the Jews were hated in Europe. Many of the places in Europe began to turn anti-Semitic, and they hated the Jews. And so he really realized in that moment that the Jews needed to settle in their own state. They needed to leave Europe and settle in their own state. This desire and belief in Jewish nationalism is called Zionism. And this belief and idea began to spread across the world, and Jews from Europe especially began to hope to have a return to their homeland. Now remember, he was a journalist, so he was able to spread this information to a wide group of people. And the idea began to catch fire, and people began to start longing to go back and have a Jewish state in their original homeland in Israel. And this was spurred on by anti-Semitism in Europe. Massive number of Jews actually began to immigrate to the ancient Holy Land. They built settlements there. Between 1882 and 1903, about 35,000 Jews relocated to Palestine. And between 1904 and 1914, about 40,000 more Jews settled in the land. Then we get to the time of World War I. Now, it's important to understand that in 1917, before World War I had ended, Zionism was becoming a very popular thing among Jews. Well, the British government actually expressed support for a Jewish homeland in the land of Palestine. With a World War I victory, Great Britain actually took control of the land of Palestine. A lot of people don't realize that Great Britain actually controlled the land of Israel for a while. They actually controlled it until after World War II. So they had it in World War I, they won it, and they controlled the land all the way through World War II. Then there was an Arab revolt. Now, you got to remember 1917, you know, early 1900s, World War I is fought, Great Britain grabs control of the land, but Jews are flooding to the land of Israel. And in the 1930s, an Arab revolt took place in the land of Palestine when they became threatened by the idea of a Jewish state and they feared they would become a minority. Now, remember in 1900, during the Ottoman Empire, and that's just 30 years before this, 94% of the people living in the land of Palestine were Arab Palestinians. Palestinians. All of a sudden, Jews are flooding to the land, and the Arabs began to fear that they would become the minority. So they actually rose up to revolt and fight against the Jews and Britain who were there. The British worked with Jewish militias to end the revolt, but that hostility grew and continued. It didn't just end, even though the fighting stopped, they began to be hostile towards the Jews. So I want to make sure you're still with me. That's a lot of history we just covered. Back in the day, before 70 AD, Israel was in the land. Long time ago, they had a Jewish temple they were there. All of a sudden, Rome comes in, kicks the Jews out. Rome takes over. They renamed the land Palestine, and they take over the land. However, they didn't last. They lasted for a long time, but eventually the Ottoman Empire came in, Islamic Caliphate kicked Rome out, and they ruled the land. During that time, however, in the early 1900s, all of a sudden, Jews started moving to the land of Israel, longing for that state that they could call their own. Then Great Britain came in in World War I. Ottoman Empire was ended. Great Britain took control of the land, and more Jews came to the land. That's where we are. There was an Arab revolt in there, but the British and the Jews were able to shut that down. So then we get to the time of the Holocaust. And after the events of the Holocaust and World War II, Britain retracted their support of a Jewish state. So all the way from World War I all the way through World War II, they had continually said that they supported a Jewish state in the land of Palestine. But after the events of the Holocaust, Britain retracted their support for a Jewish state. But Jews still flooded into the land. Jewish militias actually began to fight against the British, and Britain killed Jews, captured them, and held them without trial. And again, this is after the Holocaust. So they had just came through what happened in Germany and what Hitler did, and now Britain is killing them, capturing them, and holding them without trial. Not as bad is what happened with the Holocaust, but definitely not good. By 1947, the British were ready to refer the Palestine problem, is what they called it, to the newly created UN. So the United Nations has been set up, and they want to say, hey, you deal with this. We're tired of dealing with this. Palestinian Arabs and the Jews are fighting. We don't know what to do. United Nations, you come up with a plan. So the UN came up with an agreement to partition the land. And what they said is that there would be an Arab-Palestinian state, there would be a Jewish state, and the city of Jerusalem, which would be 
its own entity held under an international trusteeship. So you'd have an Arab state, the Palestinian state, and a Jewish state. Two state system with Jerusalem being held by the UN. And this is what that would look like. So in Palestine, in the UN partition plan, this was in 1947, the Arab state would be the yellow. The Jewish state would be the orange. The Jews were ecstatic about this. They wanted their own state. This would give them their own state. They're happy, but the Arabs were not happy. Palestinians did not like this plan. They didn't want a two-state solution. They wanted the land because they believed it was theirs, and they did not want there to be a Jewish state at all. Arab militias and militaries began to wage war on the Jewish community in Palestine, and the situation caused the U.S. to remove support for that partition plan formed by the U.N. The U.S. initially supported that when the Arab militias and militaries began to wage war on the Jewish community. The U.S. removed its support for the Arab state and just said, we support a one-state solution and give the Jews their state. That actually emboldened the Arabs to continue to fight. However, the Jews were able to fight back, causing the Arabs to withdraw their attacks. Britain then pulled out of the region in 1948 because the hostilities grew too much for them to deal with. And on May 14, 1948, the Jewish People's Council gathered and announced the establishment of a Jewish state called the State of Israel. So on May 14, 1948, they declared their independence as a sovereign nation called the State of Israel. To make sure everybody's still with me, here's what's happening. Britain controlled the land after World War I. However, Israel came in and Britain was kicked out. They renamed the land the State of Israel, except the Gaza Strip and West Bank, which the Palestinians still kind of controlled at that time. Israel declared to be a nation. The U.S. came in and said, welcome to the country club. Ah, ah, see what I did there? See what I did there? Also, the Soviet Union came in and said, you are legit now. And of course, the U.S. did it. The Soviet Union comes in and does it and kind of connects us up with the commies. Freaking commies. So on the very first day after Israel declared themselves a sovereign state, Arab forces from Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq invaded Israel and went on the offensive. This was the very next day after they declared themselves to be a sovereign nation. Britain actually initiated a U.N. embargo on arms to the region, leaving Israel defense but Czechoslovakia violated that embargo, supplied Israel with military weaponry and equipment that matched the invading armies. They gave Israel a chance. If it wasn't for Czechoslovakia, Israel may not even exist today because they did not have a standing chance fighting all of these militaries apart from that weaponry. During the fighting, the UN actually brokered a one-month ceasefire and Jewish immigrants began to flood the nation and join the IDF just so they can continue fighting when that ceasefire was over. After the ceasefire, the war continued. Israel was able to overcome and the tide turned and Israel pushed the Arab forces back. The war ended with permanent ceasefires put in place and Israel defending itself as a new nation. So this is what happened in the war. Here's the land of Israel. Israel gained the land of Galilee, Jezreel Valley, West Jerusalem, the coastal plain, and the Negev. That's all of that light colored area there. Israel gained all of that land. The Syrians actually got a strip of territory along the Sea of Galilee originally allocated to the Jewish state, Golan Heights region. Lebanon actually won the land of Rush Hanikra. Egypt gained control of the Gaza Strip. That's that little strip of land right there. And then Jordan gained the land of the West Bank. And so that's how it all broke down after the war. Four different nations, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and Israel controlling different parts of the land, with Israel winning the majority of the land there. So what happened after the war? Well, after the war, Britain released its Jewish prisoners, recognized the state of Israel, finally. The the UN admitted Israel as a member of the UN and recognized them as a sovereign state. Over 700,000 Palestinians fled during the war and they became refugees in surrounding nations with a large number of them in Jordan. And from 1948 to 1967, Israel established its government and the land distribution remained unchanged. In 1959, Egypt actually abandoned the all-Palestine government, which is the government in Gaza from 1948 set up by the Palestinians, and they merged into the Arab Republic. In 1964, Yasser Arafat created the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO for short. And in June of 1967, war broke out in Israel again. This time between Israel, Jordan, which controlled the West Bank, Egypt, which controlled the Gaza Strip and Sinai Peninsula, and Syria, which controlled Golan Heights. And for six days, the war was fought, but Israel decimated the armies of all three nations. Now, there's a lot of detail here of why this war broke out. It wasn't just a random war. Egypt had actually blocked off a 
main water strait that brought supplies into Israel and they moved troops to the bank of Israel. And so Israel actually struck first, getting the surprise on Egypt and it led to the war. Now that being said, Israel won, decimated all three nations and the six day war was over. It literally was fought for six days. Israel gained the Gaza Strip from Egypt and they actually gained the Sinai Peninsula. Now they do not control the Sinai Peninsula today due to a peace deal they tried to make with Egypt later on. They actually gave the Sinai Peninsula back. They kept the Gaza Strip. They also gained Golan Heights from Syria. So that area up there that was circled, that's Golan Heights. They gained that. And they also gained the West Bank from Jordan. So now Israel controlled all of the land of Israel, the West Bank, Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip. And for a period of time, the Sinai Peninsula as well. So what followed this? Well, after the Six-Day War, Arafat established PLO headquarters in Jordan. He couldn't set it up in Gaza, so he set up the PLO headquarters in Jordan. However, there was a civil war in Jordan and the Palestinians relocated to Lebanon. The Palestinians began to launch attacks on Israel from Lebanon. Israel would defend itself and respond and it would just go back and forth. In 1978, the Palestinians hijacked an Israeli bus and 38 Israelis were killed, including 13 children and 71 Israelis were injured. This was kind of a breaking point for Israel. So Israel invaded Palestinian controlled areas of Lebanon. While Israel occupied the area, the attack stopped. When Israel would withdraw, the attacks would begin again. Lebanon actually ended up breaking out in a civil war and the Palestinians were attacking Israel and fighting Lebanese forces. After Palestinians tried to assassinate an Israeli diplomat, Israel joined Lebanon and they were able to drive the Palestinian out of the PLO headquarters and hold them at bay. Israel occupied the Palestinian area of Lebanon and by 1985 they only occupied a small 10 kilometer strip. Palestinians began another wave of attacks against Israel in 1987 through 1991 and this was called the first intifada. Intifada just meaning uprising. So this was the first major uprising from 1987 to 1991. In the early 1990s though there was a strong international push for peace in the Middle East and in 1993 the Oslo Accords were signed between the PLO which is now known as the Palestinian Authority and Israel. It was a peace deal that would allow the Palestinians to actually return to the Gaza Strip and some areas of the West Bank and have limited self-governance. Many celebrated the Accords but there were extremist groups within the Palestinians such as Hamas that did not agree to the Accords and they immediately began launching further attacks on Israel once in Gaza. Again so if you're still tracking with me here's what happened. Israel fought this war the Six Day War. Palestinians got kicked out they went to Jordan. In Jordan civil war breaks out so they go to Lebanon. In Lebanon they start to attack Israel and they send rockets and other things to Israel attacking them. Well, Israel puts up with it for so long, but eventually they go and they occupy the part of Lebanon that the Palestinians are in to keep the Palestinians from attacking them. Then the Oslo Accords were entered, and this was a peace deal that they tried to make, allowing the Palestinians to move back to the land of Israel into the Gaza Strip and West Bank. Now you would think that this would be a good sign. The Oslo Accords would be peaceful and everything would be great. But because of people like Hamas, groups like Hamas, they did not want to see a two-state solution. So from Gaza, they began to fire rockets and attack Israel. That's where we're at. This led to the second intifada. So for years, the peace process was hindered by acts of violence by groups like Hamas. Israel would attempt to negotiate, but it all fell apart in 2000. From 2000 to 2005, Palestinians launched deadly attacks on Israel from Gaza. And Israel actually had a military presence in Gaza after the Oslo Accords. But in 2005, Israel removed all Israeli settlers and soldiers from Gaza. While they did remove their military force, Israel does still control Gaza's airspace territorial waters and controls the movement of people or goods in and out via air or water. So they did remove their military presence. However, they still got some control. Again, it is their land. If you notice, there's one thing about this. Israel did not go and just steal the land. They tried to go in multiple times and work for peace to have a two-state solution. Remember, it was Israel's land before it was the Palestinians' land. They were kicked out and attacked by Rome and they were oppressed by Rome. It was Rome that kicked them out of the land. It was Israel's land first. However, even knowing that, they tried to work to have a two-state solution multiple times with the Palestinians. Palestinians would not have it and they continued in violence to attack Israel over and over and over again. Groups like Hamas are really responsible for this. In 2006, Hamas won partial control of the Palestinian Authority through an election. Hamas was a terrorist organization responsible for the attacks on Israel. Israel threatened economic sanctions unless Hamas 
terrorists agreed to the previous Palestinian agreements with Israel, disavow the violence, and recognize Israel's right to exist. Of course, Hamas rejected. In 2007, an internal Palestinian battle broke out between Hamas and Fatah. Hamas won and took full control of Gaza. Since Hamas gained control, they will sporadically attack Israel, launching rockets into Israel, harming its citizens, and Israel will respond. While some support Israel, there is a growing number of people condemning Israel for responding because Palestinian civilians have been killed. And we're going to look into that in just a moment, whether it's Israel targeting civilians. We're going to look at that. But if you again recognize Israel has tried to work for peace, Hamas and the Palestinians have consistently fought against it. So what is this really all about? We've, we've kind of looked at the history of the conflict, but what is it really about? Is it about the land? Well, no, Israel only comprises 0.2% of all of the Middle East land. Even when Israel, Israel relinquished the Gaza Strip to be ruled by the Palestinian Authority in exchange for peace, the promised peace never materialized. They got the land, they got some land that they wanted, and it never brought peace. Under Hamas's rule, Gaza has actually deteriorated substantially since the 2005 agreement. When Israel pulled out its military forces out of Gaza, they pulled them out, allowed Gaza to be completely ran by the Palestinians, other than the air and water, and it's fallen apart. Its government invests its resources to build up arms for attacking Israel, rather than improving the quality of life for its citizens. They don't seem to care about their own citizens. What about a Palestinian state? Is this all about having a Palestinian state? Well, first of all, Palestinian Arabs were never self-governing. Remember, they've been living in the region and they've been ruled repeatedly by group after group after group. At first it was the Romans and the Byzantines, then Muslims, then Crusaders, the Ottoman Empire, then it was Great Britain. None of this shows them having any actual government of their own ever. This isn't them wanting a return to something they had that was taken from them. This is them wanting something they've never actually had. For centuries, Palestinian Arabs did not demand an independent state and self-rule. In United Nations Resolution 181, the 1947 agreement dividing the land made provision to offer the local Arabs their own state in Palestine. But they refused the plan, rejected the formation of the nation of Israel, and demanded the whole region, which was never originally theirs to begin with. As a matter of fact, Israel's offered a Palestinian state of their own five times, and each time it was rejected. Number one was the British agreement agreed to a two-state solution with Israel before World War II, and what their actual proposal was would give 80% of the territory to the Palestinians, and Israel only 20%. Palestine rejected that. The second time, in 1947, the UN agreed to a two-state solution. The Jews accepted it, Palestinians rejected it. Third time, in 1967, after the Six-Day War, there was talks about giving the Gaza and West Bank to the Palestinians, but the Palestinians met with the Arab League in Sudan and rejected all negotiations with Israel. That was the third time they rejected it. In 2000, Arafat and the Prime Minister of Israel met at Camp David. Israel offered the Palestinians a state in all of Gaza and 94% of the West Bank with East Jerusalem. Bill Clinton said that Arafat was there for 14 days and said no to everything. This rejection started the Second Intifada. And then in 2008, Israel tried again. Israel offered the Palestinians a state in all of Gaza and 94% of the West Bank with East Jerusalem, just like in 2000, but included additional land to make the deal better. Palestine rejected it again. So five different times they were offered their own individual Palestinian state and they've rejected it every single time. So no, this isn't about a Palestinian state. Is it because Israel is evil and they are an apartheid state? Is that why they hate them? Well, first of all, Israel's not an occupying nation forcing apartheid on Palestinians. Apartheid is officially sanctioned racial segregation along with economic and political discrimination. Israel doesn't do that. Arab Israelis are full citizens. They have the same rights as Jewish Israelis. Arabs hold political and military positions, including among Israel's courts and governing body, the Knesset. Arabs participate freely in the Israeli economy without segregation of facilities or services. Israel protects the religious freedom of all its citizens, regardless of their faith. As a matter of fact, over half of the citizens of the state of Israel are Arabs. They are not European Jews. And a lot of people don't realize that, that a lot of the Jews who flooded to Israel were from Arab nations and they were Arab people. This isn't a racial issue. Even though people try to make it a racial issue, it isn't. They are not an apartheid state. So what is this all about? Ultimately, it's about the hatred of Israel. The Palestinian Charter calls for the eradication of Israel by armed struggle. It also calls for the promotion and protection of its fighters, as well as the mobilization of Arabs. It even calls for bringing up Palestinians in a revolutionary fashion, preparing them to sacrifice their lives for the cause. This is nothing other than pure hatred for Jewish people and the state of Israel. So we want to talk about, does Israel actually target civilians? A lot of people have claimed Israel's targeting innocent civilians in Palestine. Is that actually 
actually happening. Well, let's take a look and see if that is actually happening. يا حبيبي انا بقدرش اطلع كل الناس هذول من اللي انا بدي اقل شيء ساعتين على ما كلهم يطلعوا يا يا اخوي يا اخوي لو ما لو ما بتطلع انا بطوخ انت طوخ انت بتطلع انا بطوخ طوخ اللي بدك اياه تسويه اللي بتنزل الارض وتتلقاه لا اخوي اخوي لازم الواحد لازم يعمل كل شيء من شان ما تموت احنا بدنا عندنا عندك عندك مسؤوليه عندك مسؤوليه على الاطفال بدنا نموت كل الاطفال لازم يموتوا لا لا سمح الله لا سمح الله بدك تستشهد عشان تبين بشعتكم This is a very eye opening video. This is a conversation between a IDF soldier in Israel and someone in Palestine where they had called in advance to try to get the building evacuated that they were going to bomb. And you'll notice Israel was giving advance warning. That's first of all. Understand that Israel is not just bombing civilians just because they want to. They actually called and tried to evacuate this building. It was Hamas and the Palestinians who said, no, we will not evacuate. If the children need to die, let them die. We want to die. Why? Because we want to reveal your cruelty to the world. This idea that Israel targets civilians is nothing but terrorist propaganda. They do not target civilians, but the terrorists in Gaza, Hamas, they actually use these civilians as human shields for the sole purpose of making it look like Israel's purposely killing civilians so they can stir up hatred for Israel in the world. And it's working. There's a lot of people in the U.S. government who have turned on Israel. Look at another video where we can clearly see Israel is not targeting civilians. على السبيل متقربين لكاب بايت ممليت لفتل كيبالت اديو خدال יש גם תנועה לציר פה איפה שאני זבזיז עכשיו וגם איפה שני עיגולים יש אנשים נאחים כל האזור הזה מלא מלא as you can see, there is constantly tons of videos where they are calling off strikes because there are plenty of civilians there that cannot be evacuated. Israel is not targeting civilians. Now, what about Hamas? Is Hamas targeting civilians? Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you in this video that you're about to see, it's cut off a little bit some of the words that are being said, so I will fill you in on what they're saying. So this person is saying, we're not condemning our people to death. No, we are leading our people to death. I mean, we are leading them to die. This is a Palestinian saying, where are the Hamas's leaders? The civilians are here, where are the leaders? We are witnessing something very, very unusual in this plot of land abandoned plot of land right next to our hotel. A blue tent has come up. It wasn't there last night. It came up just this morning and there have been two men moving in and out of it. Now, by reasonable doubt, it's fair to guess that this is a potential Hamas rocket launching site that's being set up. There's always been this question of, of how Hamas manages to fire its rockets uh, without being detected by the Israelis. This perhaps is one of the ways of assembling it under a tent. It also establishes something which Hamas has always been accused of, that they actually use densely populated civilian areas to fire their rockets. And if the camera zooms out a little more, you'll see that this is a is an area very heavily built up, a lot of residential and uh, hotel buildings all around. And so if Hamas does fire a rocket from here, it will have immediate consequences for everyone around here. And I also must report at this point that the first night when we came here, we did see or rather hear a rocket go off exactly at that plot of land and the, hotel, and the hotels opposite us were evacuated because the Israelis sent a warning that there might be a strike on them. That didn't happen, but 
If Hamas uses this site once again to launch a rocket, uh, we're not sure what's going to happen. So now, uh, as you can see, the tent has been removed. Whatever they were doing under the tent is clearly over. We also find that they're not two people, two individuals, but three uh, who are behind uh, this particular activity. And uh, they've placed a, a, a sort of a bush on top of uh, whatever they've, they've buried under the sand. And also they're using a spade to cover it up with mud. And uh, it looks like they're prepared to leave. But of course, during this whole process, they were running some cables uh, out from under the tent to somewhere at the back. And uh, it, it now remains to be seen whether if this is indeed uh, a Hamas rocket launch site, that they're going to use it uh, to, to detonate it remotely. We can see one of the men leaving. He's got something on his head. Uh, he just looks like he's coming out either onto the road or he's uh, gone behind the tree there. Uh, the other guy is standing uh, behind the tree again. As I said, this is a very, very unusual sight uh, to actually witness in Gaza the possibility that we're seeing uh, Hamas setting up uh, for a rocket launch just meters away uh, from our hotel. And again, as I point out, bang in the middle of what is a, a residential area full of hotels and apartment buildings. So that's the rocket being fired today morning, a day after it was assembled at the exact spot the rocket has been fired. That's the smoke. We just shot a video of it in the immediate aftermath. Okay, so we're heading to the spot where uh, we saw the rocket from being fired. It seems to be in an open plot of land, but uh, we're being asked by people not to go to the location. Uh, so we're just pulling back. And uh, we're just heading back because some journalists there, uh, as you can see, have waved to us saying not to go there. Okay, so we're not actually going in there because uh, it's been rightly pointed out to us that there could be an immediate Israeli retaliation uh, to the rocket that was fired from here. But uh, as we've uh, reported uh, or as we managed to capture on camera earlier, we actually saw uh, that particular rocket silo being placed. But reporting it uh, while we're here in Gaza also has serious security implications uh, for both those around here and also for us, uh, which is why this report uh, might actually have to air earlier. But you can see very clearly this is a very, very dense residential and commercial area and therefore firing the rocket from here will obviously have serious consequences uh, for those who live here should Israel choose to retaliate. In Gaza, with camera person Sanjay Mandal and Neha Masih, Srinivasan Jain for NDTV. So this is a very eye-opening video. You can see here that not only did they call for the death of their civilians in the early part of this video, but with this reporter, they purposely set up rockets to fire into Israel from residential areas, from places where civilians are, not from military installations, not out in the middle of nowhere, right in the middle of civilians. Hamas is purposely trying to harm their civilians and using them as human shields. We're ready to blow up buses.
الداخلية كذلك دعت للمواطنين لعدم الاستجابة لتحذيرات الاحتلال ندعو أبناء شعبنا الفلسطيني وندعوهم للبقاء في بيوتهم فإنه إثبتوا في بيوتكم كما عهدناكم ولا تستجيبوا لحرب الإشاعات ولهذه الحرب النفسية التي يشدها العدو الصهيوني خماس is encouraging Palestinian civilians to become human shields for terror targets أعتقد أنه أن يتعرض الناس وأن يواجهوا الطيران العسكري الإسرائيلي بصدور عاري يعني يحمل أعتقد أنه هذه سياسة أثبتت نجاعتها في مواجهة الاحتلال من هذا ما يجب أن يسمع الشعب نحن مش اليوم نسوق شعبنا للإعدام ونتفرج لا نحن بنقود شعبنا إلى الموت Suheb Youssef was a member of Hamas. Now he's speaking out against the organization. I grew up with Hamas, worked for Hamas, but when I was exposed to their corruption, I left them. Working from Hamas's political bureau in Turkey, Suheb details its real activities. Hamas. Hamas activates security military institutions in Turkey under civilian guise. They use sophisticated devices to eavesdrop on Palestinian authority. They use this to push forward the foreign agenda. And that's what I want to expose. Hamas uses this info against the interest of the Palestinian people. They sell this info to Iran in exchange for financial help. He also says Hamas uses its bureau in Turkey to orchestrate terror attacks against Israelis. Hamas recruits people in the West Bank and funds them, including sending innocent children to carry out terror attacks. But the reason may surprise you. The goal of terror attacks in the West Bank is to kill civilians, not for the resistance, not for Jerusalem, not for liberating Palestine, not even because they hate Jews. They send these innocents to export the crisis from Gaza to the West Bank. What did you hear about Gaza? That there are problems in Gaza? Hamas is the problem. About the siege, the problem is Hamas. They rule by force. Harsh words from any man against his former organization. But Suhaib is not just any Hamas operative. He is the son of Hassan Yusuf one of the founders of Hamas in the West Bank. My father is one of those people who has been deceived by Hamas. I call on Hamas leaders and my own father, Hassan Youssef, to leave the corrupt Hamas organization. Suhaib is the second son in his family to come out against Hamas. His older brother, Mossab, now known internationally as the Green Prince, worked as a double agent for the Israeli Shin Bet internal security organization for a decade before fleeing to the U.S. My brother's story never influenced me. I have no contact with him. I didn't betray Hamas. I was loyal to them. Suhaib sacrificed everything by leaving and speaking out against Hamas, including putting his life in danger. If Hamas wants to make me a martyr, I will be a martyr. I'd prefer being a victim than harming other people. Hamas has no problem killing. They murder in cold blood. They have no problem with that. So as you can see, Hamas, which is the government of the Palestinians right now, Hamas is evil. And it specifically, this is someone who was in Hamas admitting they were there to target civilians, not for the resistance, not for the Palestinian people. They specifically targeted civilians. Seen here is a battle plan captured during the present operation, illustrating how the seemingly innocent streets and narrow alleyways are in fact booby-trapped with powerful explosive devices. When detonated, devastating damage would be brought upon the surrounding buildings. Here, Hamas aimed to compound the devastation by placing its explosive device in a petrol station, using it to trigger a far greater explosion that would destroy everything within its vicinity. Hamas doctrine has turned the residential areas of the Gaza Strip into one enormous minefield, wreaking havoc in the heart of civilian dwellings with every detonation.
So we can see here that Hamas has now not only used human shields and fired rockets from populated areas, they booby-trapped the streets around their targets, knowing that when Israel strikes it, it will hit their booby traps as well and cause larger explosions to kill more people. Hamas is using human shields. Hamas are the war criminals. Israel is not targeting civilians. So that kind of leads us to the current conflict in 2021. What happened? How did this all begin? again. Did Israel turn on the Palestinians or was it Hamas or what happened? So it actually all started escalating in April. And here's why the Supreme Court in Israel was about to actually rule on evicting Palestinian residents living in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. Now, here's the context of that. Prior to the 1948 conflict, the Jewish families lived in these homes in East Jerusalem. However, in the War of Independence, Jordan had actually gained control of East Jerusalem when they gained control of the West Bank. So Jordan kicked the Jews in East Jerusalem out and Palestinians moved into these homes as refugees in Jordan. However, in 1967, during the Six Day War, Israel actually gained control of the East Jerusalem back and the Palestinians of this neighborhood, however, did not leave. So in 1948, when Israel lost the West Bank to Jordan, Jordan kicked out the Israelites who were living there and gave that property to the refugees from Palestine. Again, Israel wins that back, but when Israel wins that back in 1967, they don't immediately immediately go in and kick out the Palestinians. But they did establish a law that was set in Israel allowing Jews to return to those properties that they were removed from during the war for independence. The Palestinians believe East Jerusalem should still be theirs even though Israel won it in 1967 and will be their capital of their future state while it's currently in Israel's land. This ruling led Palestinians in Jerusalem to begin to protest. So again, the Supreme Court's basically saying, hey, this property belonged to the Israelites who were kicked out by Jordan. Jordan, it is theirs and they should be able to return to it. The Palestinians need to move out of that land and move to Gaza and the places that Israel, who controls the land, has stated that the Palestinians could be in. And there's this big to-do about it and it caused issues. Now, before you get all angry and say, how dare they evict people who've been living there since 1948? How dare they evict them? You've got to remember that it was Israelites, it was the Jews who were evicted first. It was the Palestinians that kicked the Jews out of those homes, not the Jews who kicked the Palestinians out of those homes. So keep that in mind. So they began to protest as a result of this, and the protests were escalated by the fact that Israel was not letting certain gatherings happen in East Jerusalem for the month of Ramadan as a result of the pandemic. So because of the pandemic, they were trying to avoid certain mass gatherings. Well, the month of Ramadan is a Muslim holy month that has plenty of events planned, and Israel was not allowing those gatherings to happen, which caused the Muslims to begin to get angry. The protests began to rage on, and they ended up growing violent, and it culminated at Al-Aqsa, and I may be pronouncing that incorrect, Al-Aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem, while many Muslim Palestinians gathered to celebrate then the end of their holy month. After prayer, the gathering turned to protest for evictions. Thousands of people were there, and Israeli police showed up to make sure to stop any violence. The protesters began to riot and throw stones, fireworks, and other projectiles at the police. This isn't just a claim from the police. It is clearly on video. Here's the video amid growing anger over the potential eviction of Palestinians from land claimed by Jewish settlers. Tens of thousands of Palestinians packed into the hilltop. So you can clearly see they are throwing stones, fireworks, other projectiles at the police, which obviously can cause harm. The police responded and intervened and began to fire tear gas and rubber bullets to stop the violence. This angered Hamas and the Palestinians, and this led to terror attacks in Israel over the event. Arab rioters in Lod threw stones and firebombs at Jewish homes, a school, and a synagogue, and later attacked a hospital, which this led to back and forth attacks between Arab Palestinians and Jewish Israelis. Rocks were thrown at Jewish apartments 
and Jewish residents were evacuated from their homes by the police. Synagogues and a Muslim cemetery were vandalized. A Jewish man was critically wounded after being struck in the head by a brick, and he died six days later. Jewish rioters then began to throw rocks at passing vehicles. Again, it went on both sides. Palestinians started this violent wave of attacks, and the Jewish rioters began to riot back, and it kind of escalated from there. Shooting and stabbing attacks on buses in Jerusalem began to happen. A Jewish man was attacked and seriously injured by an Arab mob armed with sticks and stones while he was driving his car. Violence, including riots, stabbings, arson, attempted home invasions, and shootings were reported from Beersheba, Rahat, Ramla, Lod, Nereshira, Tiberias, Jerusalem, Haifa, and Acre. All over the place, these began to break out. An Israeli soldier was actually severely beaten in Jaffa and had to be hospitalized for a skull fracture and cerebral hemorrhage, and two civilians, including a paramedic and a police officer, were shot by Arab assailants in Lod and Ramla. Again, it got pretty intense. Along with all of this violence of rioting and terrorism, Hamas delivered an ultimatum to Israel to remove all its police and military personnel from both the Haran al-Sharif mosque site and the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood by May 10th at 6 p.m. If it failed to do so, they announced that the combined militias of Gaza would strike Israel. Minutes after the deadline passed, Hamas fired more than 150 rockets into Israel from Gaza. An anti-tank missile was also fired at an Israeli civilian vehicle in injuring the driver. Israel responded with launching airstrikes of its own into Gaza. This continued for 11 days. Hamas firing rockets, Israel firing missiles. Hamas firing rockets, Israel firing missiles. On May 21st, Qatar, Egypt, and the UN were able to broker a ceasefire that Israel unanimously agreed to, and Hamas stated they would agree to as well. At the time of this recording, about four days after the ceasefire, both sides have held to it so far. And that kind of leads us to the end here, and that, that's what happened in 2021. Again, if you'll notice, it all boils down to Hamas and the Palestinians hating Israel and not wanting to accept that there is a Jewish state of Israel in the land. They will not accept a two-state arrangement. They want Israel wiped off the face of the planet. If Hamas were to put down its weapons, there would be peace. If Israel were to put down its weapons, there would be no Israel. In other words, Israel is only defending itself, which it has a right to do, against these violent attacks. They do not target civilians, and they are not the aggressors. Hamas and the Palestinians refuse to recognize Israel as a state, and so they are fighting against Israel. Every sovereign nation has a right to defend its citizens. And that is exactly what Israel was doing. If you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Drop a comment below and tell me what you think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Is there any new information you found in this video? Put it in the comment. Is there any other information that I didn't include in this that you think is interesting? Put it in a comment. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching. For more videos, click subscribe and hit that notification bell. And if you enjoyed the video, click that like button. See you next time.